the church's one foundation is Jesus Christ, our Lord. know how many of you enjoy these great hymns of the church and what a great and rich message they carry and the hymn that we are about to sing certainly reminds us of what our great Savior has done for us saving and helping and keeping and loving and he truly is with us to the very end
I'm going to start this message in what might seem like an odd way. I'm actually going to tell a couple of jokes. But when I tell these jokes, I want you to pay attention because I'm going to pause and I want you to pay attention to what's going on inside of you, just sort of the dynamic that's going on when a joke is told, when a setup is made, and then we're waiting for an answer. So here's the first joke, and these are just two jokes that I found on the internet right off the bat. There's really no deep thought into this. But here's the first one. Why couldn't the bicycle stand up by itself? Now, I want you to pay attention to what's going on. If you actually care, why couldn't the bicycle stand up by itself? Now, you're trying to come up with a couple of answers yourself. What would the answer be? Am I clever enough to figure it out? I know there's some kind of a pun. Maybe there's a wordplay, but you're waiting for the answer. And you don't really know it. You're not convinced. You have no idea what it really is until you hear me give you the punchline. What, why couldn't the bicycle stand up by itself? It was too tired. Now, the minute you hear that, oh, there might be a groan, there'll be a, oh, wow, you made us wait for all of that. And some of you got it. And if you're anything like me, sometimes you'll hear a joke like this and you won't get it until next Tuesday. But hopefully, there's a moment like this when all of a sudden the resolve comes, where the punchline comes in. One more, just so we can have a little fun. But uh, here's the second joke. What did the triangle say to the circle? Think about it. What did the triangle say to the circle? See where you're at? I would really like to know. I could maybe live without knowing. I could walk away and be okay. It might bug you type A people a little bit more than those of us that says, okay, all right. But once again, here's the setup. What did the triangle say to the circle? You're pointless. Ah, <laughs> Now, I know some of you might be throwing stuff. Please don't turn off the screen yet. Please don't. I promise that'll be the last of the jokes. But what I want to draw attention to today is these things I know you've heard about them before, but they're called aha moments. Aha! Where all of a sudden, oh, that moment of recognition, of learning. And if you and I are honest with ourselves, you know what? We kind of like these. We want these in our lives, don't we? We instinctively know that there are aha moments that aren't just jokes, but they're actually powerful and transformative. There is always a significant before and after in our understanding when we're paying attention to aha moments. And maybe you've heard me say this before, but for example, just a simple two plus two equals oh, four. I get it, two and two is four. Now here's the thing with aha moments, is they're so transformative that you're really never able to go back to the person that you were before you came to the punchline or the understanding. My life is forever altered because I got it. The aha moment of two plus two is four. I can never go back, really, to that time beforehand. So what's an aha moment? Thanks to Chaplain Gary, he does a lot of uh, uh, things where he does initials, and, uh, and uh, I'd like to share mine. Here's my attempt at being Chaplain Gary. But aha moment, it stands for three things. The first one is awakening. An aha moment is an awakening. All of a sudden, you're in the dark, and there's an awakening of your understanding. Oh, there's all of a sudden a light bulb that goes on. It's an awakening. The H stands for, in an aha moment, honesty. When truth comes at us honestly, when we get to the bottom of things, where there's something that's true and real and honest and significant, we know that there's a special moment there, don't we? And then the last one is, if, if I'm awakened by an honest truth, well, hopefully I don't just stand there and just say, oh, I acknowledge that, but there's some form of action, some sort of movement. Again, a change in our understanding, a change even in our DNA, and we move a little bit differently than we did before. What about spiritual aha moments? I want you to pay a little attention, maybe you're in your own life. I know many of you would have stories of aha moments that are related to your faith, to your understanding of God to your understanding of who Jesus is in your own life. And uh, those can come in any way, shape, or form. Sometimes it might be a season, but often they come, and there'll be stories that we tell of significant moments. And I believe they kind of have to happen in the life of a believer. We should have stories, testimonies of those moments. One of mine is, um, I was 20 years old, and I grew up in a Christian home. I had a father as a pastor, and my mom is literally a saint. I had nothing to really rebel against when I was growing up. But at 20 years old, I started to listen to other voices when I went off to college. 
And so an aha moment of mine is I was a sophomore in college and I got involved into the party scene. I really didn't a lot, but at this time I went on a Friday, I went on a weekend, and the last thing I remember, friends, was throwing up out of the window of Lamna Chi Alpha. And after that, I remember very little, if anything. I got back to my dorm room the following morning and I don't have a recollection of how that happened. So the next morning when I woke up, I was really scared. And I had to walk across the campus to go and uh, be a part of a Christian meeting, a Christian organization meeting that I was a part of that day. And I was hungover and I felt lousy. And I'm walking across the tundra in uh, Valparaiso University, this wide open space. And if I've ever heard God speak to me in an audible voice, it was a conversation that went something like this. I'm walking across and all of a sudden I, I just, God whispered to me, hey, I love you. I get it. I don't wanna ruin your fun, I wanna, I wanna protect you. I wanna guard you. Please trust me. I give you these direction, these guidelines for your life because I love you. And I said, oh, you love me, you want me, you care for me. It's personal. And all of a sudden, there was an aha moment. It was so significant for me that actually I called my dad and I asked my, I told my dad what had happened, and he just kind of laughed at me. And my dad, being a very wise person, he said kind of, hey, you nincompoop, you dummy. Haven't you been paying attention to my side of the family? There's a lot of alcoholism there, and we're probably part of that. And my dad had given up drinking a long time ago. I don't ever remember him really drinking. Well, it dawned on me, I'm going to have to be careful with this thing called alcohol. But beyond that, it was a moment of spiritual transformation for me. God allowed new things to happen in my life as I took a direction that I no longer took before. I had a new understanding of what it meant to be a Christian. I started to more actively pursue his direction for my life. As a matter of fact, if uh, my wife, I've told my stories to my wife of what I used to be like before, she says, I don't think I would have liked you very much then. So thankfully, she got to know me after the season of aha, of actually saying, okay, Lord, I'm going to give and commit my life more fully to you. So here we are in this present day and age, and uh, God wants you and I to experience spiritual aha moments. And I just want to remind us, we live in New Testament times, and we have three incredibly powerful resources for aha moments from God. And by the way, saints of old didn't have these resources. People in the Old Testament all these great Bible characters, people of God, they didn't have the resources that you and I have today that are spiritual, that come from God himself. The first resource is Jesus. The long-awaited Messiah has come. He's here. He is the Savior of the world. He came, died on a cross, is resurrected from the dead, and he's still alive. Not all are saved according to the message, but salvation is offered to all through a Messiah, Jesus, a Savior that has come. What an incredible resource. The second resource is the Holy Spirit. When we say yes to the things of God, the promise is we are indwelt by His Holy Spirit. And His Holy Spirit promises to lead and guide and comfort and direct us towards ahas. That's a promise. And the third resource is, is God's Word, the Bible. It's been put together in such a way that we have holy scriptures. It's God's Word to you and to me. And we have it in a Bible that I hope isn't collecting dust somewhere on your library. So I want to spend time this morning asking the Lord to bring us aha moments in our understanding about a specific topic, and that topic is His kingdom. I want to spend some time in Mark chapter 4. I'm assuming, hoping that it's a passage that you are familiar with. But uh, there's some new understandings, some new ahas for me as I spent time in this parable of the sowers, which is actually an old friend of mine. I remember reading this when I was in my 20s. Uh, but let's take time to read Mark 4, uh, chapter 4, verses 1 through 9. It's the parable of the sower. And it says like this, and you can read along on the screen. Again, Jesus began to teach by the lake. The crowd that gathered around him was so large that he got into a boat and sat in it out on the lake, while all the people were along the shore at the water's edge. He taught them many things by parables, and in his teaching, he said this. Listen, a farmer went out to sow his seed. As he was scattering the seed, some fell along the path, and the birds came and ate it up. Some fell on rocky places. This is the second soil, where it did not have much soil. It sprang up quickly because the soil was shallow. But when the sun came up, the plants were scorched, and they withered because they had no root. Other seed fell among thorns, which grew up 
and choked the plants so they, they, they did not bear grain. Still other seed fell on good soil. It came up, it grew and produced a crop, some multiplying 30, some 60, some 100 times. And then Jesus said this, whoever has ears to hear, let them hear. Okay, so I want to highlight a couple of things. The first one is there are two groups of people. Can you recognize who those two groups are? First, we have the crowds, and then we have the disciples. So how did the crowds get there? Well, this is what's going on in these early chapters of Mark. And if you have a Bible, open it up and you can look and see these things. Jesus went about right away doing miracles. Earlier, he had healed a man with leprosy. He had healed a paralyzed man. He had cast out some demons. He had healed a man with a crooked hand on the Sabbath, no less. So all of a sudden, there was word going out that there was this guy doing amazing things. And large, large crowds started to follow him. I'm guessing you and I might have been in one of those crowds had we heard what was going on. But then there are the disciples. How did the disciples get there? Because that's another group. They're a little bit different. After the doing of his miracles, we see this dynamic in early Mark. He specifically called, after a miracle, he, he had a specific call more closely to a few specific people. Those were his disciples. So there's an important distinction here. Not just followers, but disciples. Not just the curious yet unaffected bystanders, but those that would give up everything to go after him with total focus and energy. He went and he specifically called his disciples. So this is the dynamic that we see. First there's a miracle and then a calling. So first he called Simon, Andrew, and James, and John. And then he called Levi, who was also known as Matthew. And do you remember what he was? He was a scuzz bucket. He was a tax collector. Nobody likes tax collectors. And Jesus said, you, follow me. And eventually we read in early Mark that he called 12 disciples. Now let's talk a little bit about the crowds and Jesus' relationship to them. Now Jesus, we read in all of scripture, he had care and compassion for the crowds. They were hungry and he would feed them. He had care for the crowds, compassion, grace towards them. He loved them, but he called his disciples. He called them. Now, let me take a pause. If we were to look at Jesus in modern leadership, with a modern leadership lens, I used to do leadership development at Nazareth Lutheran, and you know what we would call Jesus today? Jesus today, I'm convinced, would be seen as a failed leader. A failed leader. Why? Because he's had all these crowds that were following, but the minute things got kind of hairy and rough, they all bolted. And he would be a failed leader because his, his group never really was more than 12. He only had 12 guys that he was with, and one of them was a dud. Another important highlight is here in this portion of Scripture, of the parable, of, of the story, he, we are, are clearly made to know that he's speaking to the crowds in parables. Now we hear this phrase often when a parable is told by Jesus. Whoever has ears to hear, let them hear. What does that mean? Not all would get what he said. He was speaking to everyone, but not everyone would have the aha moment that he would want them to have. His heart is for those, but not everyone would. So here's an important dynamic that happens coming now in the rest of the story as we get to verse 10. What do we see happening here? Jesus is now going to lean in. Apart from the crowds, he's going to be only with his called disciples. He's going to be with a much smaller group. So verse 10 says this, When he was alone, the twelve and the others around him asked him about the parables. And he told them, The secret of the kingdom of God has been given to you. Are you interested? Are you wanting to know? The secret of the kingdom of God has been given to you. He's saying this to his called disciples. But to those on the outside, everything is said in parables so that they may be ever seeing but never perceiving, ever hearing but never understanding. Otherwise, they might turn and be forgiven. They're not going to understand. They're not going to even want to understand lest they be forgiven. 
lest they turn their ways. That's what's at stake. So 13, as Jesus is alone with his disciples, he turns, he says to them, don't you understand this parable? How then will you understand any parable? And then he dives in. The farmer sows the word. Some people are like seed along the path where the word is sown. The seed is God's word. As soon as they hear it, Satan comes and takes away the word that, it was, that was sown in them. You and I know some people like this, don't we? They've heard the word and it really didn't stick. All of a sudden, poof, it's just vanished. Others, like seeds sown on rocky places, okay, that's good. They hear the word and they once receive it with joy. But since they have no root, that joy lasts only for a short time. When trouble or persecution comes because of the word, they quickly fall away. They don't stick with it. 18, still others, like the seeds sown among thorns, here's the dynamic. They hear the word, but the worries of this life, pay attention. The deceitfulness of wealth, uh uh-oh. And the desires for other things come in and they choke the word, making it unfruitful. 20, others like seed sown on good soil. They hear the word, they accept it and produce a crop. Some 30, some 60, some 100 times what was sown. The secret of the kingdom of God has been given to you. What, whoa, whoa, where, what, what? The secret of God's kingdom? Uh, It's been given to me? Let's briefly talk about farmers. Farmers, I know many of you grew up on farms, and here's one thing I've learned about farmers. Farmers do not waste time. They're not just driving around on tractors. I know that. They're working very, very hard each and every day. So what is the farmer doing here? The farmer, yes, he scattered seed on all four soils, But where does a good and wise farmer spend his or her time? Farmers tend to the crop on good soil. They're not really going to waste all that much time on the other three soils. But why would they spend so much time in good soil? Because a good farmer understands that the return on a good crop is never one to one. Never. In good soil, a crop is never one-to-one in its harvest. What is the harvest in good soil? We have the answer in this story. 30, 60, whoa, we're not done yet. A hundred times what was sown. Don't miss this. 12 disciples, that's it. Probably, in all actuality, just 11. 12 disciples, these disciples were good soil and they would be more productive in God's kingdom than a crowd of thousands in other soils. Is there an aha here? Do you know how the Pharisees back in those days measured success? And by the way, it's also a measure of success that we have in churches today. Pharisees measured success by the size of their following. Hmm. Does that sound familiar? Even today, we're so enamored by crowds and by followers. That's not how Jesus measured growth in God's kingdom. This is coming from his word. This is not how Jesus is measuring growth in his kingdom. How is Jesus measuring health and growth in his kingdom? Would you like to know? According to God's word, I hope this is an incredibly important aha. How does Jesus measure health and growth in his kingdom? By the dynamic and depth of individual discipleship. The dynamic and depth of individual discipleship. Whoa, that kind of goes against some things that we've learned, right? But then Jesus drives this point home. And again, go to Mark chapter 4, and there's three stories wide in a row where Jesus hammers this home. We read immediately after the parable of the soils, we read about a lamp. One light on a stand. Not a city of lights. He's not talking about that yet. Immediately in the story after, he talks about a growing sprout, a seedling. He's not talking about a harvest. He will at one point, but not yet. 
And then the story immediately after that, he's talking about a tiny seed that eventually becomes a big, great tree. But right now, he's just talking about faith the size of a mustard seed. Do you recognize the dynamic of God's growing kingdom, of how to grow it his way? Aha. Uh -huh. If you desire discipleship in your life, and Jesus is calling you to be a disciple, just, not just a part of the crowd that says, oh, this is the stuff that we like and agree with. If you desire discipleship in your life, Jesus wants to get alone with you. He wants you to get alone with him. He wants to show, explain, help you discover, mature you. He wants to give you a bushel full of heavenly and eternal ahas. I want to end with this one picture. It's actually a battle. It's a dynamic that maybe you'll recognize. I know I do, and I recognize this in me. But take this, take this home with you and just allow some of these things to sit and simmer. But there's a battle going on that has kingdom attached to it. And the first one is, if I'm not careful, all I'm really interested in is the kingdom of me. It's what I'm comfortable with, what I like, what I appreciate, what I'm more comfortable and familiar with. It's the kind of people that I want to be around. It's basically all about me. And so many of us are so good at building the kingdom of me. But I'd like to encourage us in this message, and according to God's word, that we would become more, most interested in the kingdom of he. In God's kingdom. In being fertile soil. And we become fertile soil by asking God to use us in his way, not in ours. Let's pray. Father, thank you for this uh, challenge. And you do it all through scripture. If anyone were to follow you, they're to pick up your cross and follow you. We're to leave things behind. The rich young ruler left away sad because he had asked you, what do I need to do? to be a part of what you're a part, and you said to him, you gotta sell all your stuff, and he walked away sad because he was a very wealthy person, and then Jesus said, you know, this kind of stuff is impossible with man, but with God, all things are possible. So thank you that by your spirit, by your word, by following in full discipleship, you and the person of your son, Jesus, you can do a miracle in our lives. I pray that we would have this aha moment in our lives around the idea of discipleship, the reality of discipleship. Lord, your word tells us that even, even the devil knows that you exist, but he's not your disciple. So Father, challenge us, us. Help us to move boldly into more of a life of discipleship. Help us to ask you, crave, beg you to make us fertile soil. May there be growth in your kingdom 30, 60, even 100 times more for your work done in, through, in and through the life of your surrendered disciples. We pray these things in Jesus' name. Amen. Words from Scripture from Psalm 98 and verse 4. Make a joyful no noise to the Lord, all the earth, and break forth into joyous song and sing praises. Let us rejoice the Lord is King.